Interesting. Okay. All right. Pleasant good evening to all. Once again, I think we've had some new persons join in with us since I came in. Happy New Year to all. Glad to have you here for your module three segment of the CIM course. Uh, of course, before we begin, it's usually very helpful to appreciate why we are here. Now, some often feel as though this is the dull and insignificant part of any course, but it's important. So I don't have my sheet in front of me. Let me see how quickly I can pull that up. So I'd like to get to know everyone before we commence sessions. Uh, shortly after that, I'd like for us to address some housekeeping matters relative to the timing of classes, starting, beginning times, if we're going to take breaks, etc. Um, because I want to ensure that we have consistent alignment of practice, particularly that we are working very hard in the evening and, and in the daytime. So certainly you want that degree of flexibility. So my key question for tonight is, why risk management? Because understanding the why will help you throughout the course segments, the various segments. Firstly, dealing with the various practitioners um, across their business domains, and then understanding what does risk management mean to you, not just having the designation, right? Oftentimes, we talk about inform business decisions. We talk about aligning with the dynamics of circumstances, but what really is risk management? It, it starts with understanding your why. So without further ado, I will start with, um, I see uh, Nikesia. Is that correct? Am I pronouncing that correct? I'm just I'm I'm just using the screen names here that I see. Is that correct? Okay, she must have stepped away. So J Nell McPhee. Am I connected? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Do you want me to go ahead? Sure, go right ahead. Okay, why risk management? Uh, I got my names up. Wonderful. <laughs> there we go. So you are Shirella Sturrup. Mm -hmm. Which company do you work for, Shirella? Okay, so I am currently at IX Capital Group. Prior to that, I spent a great deal of my working life in offshore banking. I was at Julius Fair, I was at Pictet, and now I'm in the broker-dealer business now. We see the shift from traditional banking. Everything is more fintech-based. Um, and being in compliance for quite some time, I think that you know having risk management 
as a complement would strengthen my knowledge and just, you know, allow me to be a better asset to the company that I'm working for. Mm -hmm. We're an offshore banking now. Um, I, I like that. I like that approach. I like the your reason. Now, I appreciate that no one that has to like your reason. Your reason is your reason. Mm -hmm. I would I would like to tailor it. I'd like to just make some slight adjustments to um, your reason. Because you indicated you want to be a valuable asset to the organization. Mm -hmm. I want, I would like for you to start off to be a valuable asset to yourself. Right. Of course. <laughs> yes. Yes. Right. Um, oftentimes, uh, organizations have numbers. Mm -hmm. Risk management is that segment of professional discipline that supports critical thinking. You don't have to have a certification in everything. Once you know how to critically assess information that's in front of you, and even those that are, in fact, not available to you. Mm -hmm your ability to make sound judgment and critically maneuver is more valuable than anything. And oftentimes we see in many organizations, the fail, which is deeply rooted in uncertainty, um, various functions, what my role is, it's not in my daily, uh, I'm not at the table, I'm afraid to speak. Risk management is one of those designations and discipline that really come alive to support analysis mm -hmm. and decision making. So I like that. That's a good that's a good segue into some of the discussion surrounding the discipline. Awesome. So Let's move right along. We were talking to Chanel McPhee, B.O.B. All right. Oh, wow. Can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Great, because hey, I was trying to figure out. Yes, um, I'm Chanel McPhee. I'm from Bank of the Bahamas. I'm currently in the collections department where we deal with the latter part of the risk, I would say. Mm. So yeah, so yo, so yo, why is my why would be um how that don't sound right now. That doesn't sound right. But I like the division of, of the organization that you work in, given mm -hmm. the, given the impact of COVID nineteen, delinquency management has become a very critical segment of retail banking. Right. Uh, understanding customer behavior, appreciating the lessons learned to support credit sustenance, and just really appreciating the the entire how, why, what, when for better customer service delivery, even fit in proper decisions surrounding credit relationships, right? Right. So as a part of your why, I, I could imagine that there's so much work going on in delinquency that you perhaps want to work in the risk management department. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just to one to see where we could close some gaps where we may overlook a lot you know there's a lot of places and then sometimes there are some places where people don't really notice it but you notice it once you already you know complete a like a file or a client where we could just fix some places or put some glue or put some duct tape somewhere where we could try um what it, what it is um ease the leakage mm. let's say that mm. i agree with you 100 percent. so absolutely glad you're here i definitely wish you all the best with 
Thank you. Easing the, easing the leakage. Yes. <laughs> so let's transition on to, I think this is Nikisha. Nikisha. Nikisha, help me out. Am I pronouncing that correct? Hi, yes, it's Nikisia. Nikisia. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Talk to me, Nikisia. What you saying? So I am employed by the Bank of Nevis as an investment and treasury analyst. Okay, I'm gonna write that down because that was a lot. Just joking, Nikisia. That. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us. So tell us. So tell us about what's going on and why you're here. And you know, glad to have you. It's always a privilege when we have our neighbors in the Caribbean community with all of the developments that we see happening with the CFATF. And this is a great opportunity to cross leverage um, certainly best practices and applications relative to risk management and perhaps any associated discipline within the context of your portfolio. Yes, yeah, so that's why I'm here just to learn a bit more um, in the area of risk management in order to be able to better manage the risk within within the portfolio. Mm -hmm. So are you at a micro level or at a macro level? Because that can make a difference. I would say micro level. Micro? So yeah. is, it, is it micro institutional or is it micro sector? Excuse me, repeat that. Is it micro by way of the at the institutional level, or is it micro by way of the oh institution institutional level? Institutional. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good stuff. Glad to have you here, all the way from St. Kitts and Nevis. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And you see the work our girl did at the Miss Universe uh, pageant there. So <laughs> there's, 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 there's hope and run. Yes, yes. Mm. Awesome. Okay. So I think we have, let's see, Miss Ebony Roll, all the way from the Central Bank of the Bahamas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Good afternoon. Well, good evening, Mr. Williams. Mm -hmm. We meet again. Absolutely. It's a pleasure to have you as one of our instructors. Why this is going to be exciting. Oh, yes. So, Mr. Williams, my why would be, as you know, um, being in the International Firms Unit, um, being able to identify risk of the portfolios, um, what the institutions would actually consider as their risk um, and looking at their mitigating strategies. I find mm -hmm. that this course would be very useful in helping to better understand risk management um, as the institutions have strategic goals. Um, so as we all know, risk management is very important. So I find that this course would be very useful in helping to better understand risk identifying them and to ensure that there are strategies in place to, to um, actually achieve the strategic goals. Awesome, you sound certified already. Sorry? I said you sound certified already, awesome. <laughs> yes. Okay, excellent. And I'm sure IFU and the Central Bank with all of the initiatives happening um, with the current inspector and the hopeful incumbent, um, much, much is to be desired and developed within our Bahamian jurisdiction. So glad to have you here. Right. Thank you. Continuing with the Central Bank of the Bahamas, mm -hmm, I see we have Lanika Johnson.
Yes, good evening, everyone. Happy New Year to everyone. Did I pronounce everyone. that right? <clears throat> Lanika. Okay. And everyone sounds so sprightly and excited to be back in class. Unfortunately, I am severely under the weather, so I will be mostly actively listening this evening. But um, Mr. Williams, I am in the licensing unit known as authorizations unit of bank supervision central bank <clears throat> and so my why would be to be able to get an understanding of the proposed risk um when uh proposed institutions come forth to be licensed by the central bank um and also of course because i don't work on the supervision side, I do want to get a further understanding and expand my knowledge on um, risk management, particularly because I'm not, you know, actively preparing with assessments, etc. So I thought that it was necessary to get the theory and fundamental, um, you know, the, the, the fundamental building blocks from, from this course. So that is a part of my why. I know that you said that it's not always good to do it for the institution, but I like what I do and I want to be better at it. Oh, definitely. That 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 is it's always it's always a breath of fresh air when number one, there's an open mind for the discipline, and then number two, um, you really want to make a difference for yourself and for your broader community as we go through all of these changes, right? Who would have imagined that we are where we are? And for almost, and this is going into the third year of this pandemic disruption. And I wonder now if to even say it's a disruption. It could be that we were taking so long the transition that it had to happen. But I will leave my personal views on that one for a later time in our discussion. Glad for you to be here. Awesome, awesome. I love it. And last but not least, Ms. Teresa Clinton, RF Bank and Trust, all the way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, <laughs> good evening. Um, mm -hmm. I came in late. I apologize. I'm actually using my cell phone to join because I'm having internet um, problems. I can't eat this, but how it's... Um, mm -hmm. But I think we're saying why we want to um, get the certification, right? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so I am with our bank and trust. I'm transitioning to a new... Uh, bank. I'm excited about it. Um, I think for me, I'm a compliance officer, money laundering reporting officer, and I see that the responsibilities and duties of the compliance officer is evolving um, more so away from the management of compliance risk to the management of risk in general. And for me, in order to stay competitive, um, I think it's something that I have to take up and have an interest in um, beyond natural curiosity and just to develop a knowledge base uh, for risk and how risk is managed um, and how I can contribute to the management of risk within an organization. So that's my why. Wonderful, wonderful. It's always a delight to have a diversity of financial institutional professionals within this course. I myself, I am the VP and CRO Enterprise Risk Management at Commonwealth Bank. Um, I am transitioning as a assistant manager from the central bank. Uh, much of my background was deeply immersed and fundamentalized within assurance, uh, risk advisory practices uh, within capital markets, um, um, asset management, et cetera. And 
when risk management really, because it's still in its infancy in our part of the world, but the larger developed financial institutions, sectors, and global communities have always been there. Um, I took wind of it when I was working at a Swiss offshore bank. Um, many of you may or may not know um, Fintabank and Trust. Um, there were some strategic partnerships with JP Morgan and uh, Deutsche Bank um, when they were, in fact, um, a very credible institution. Um, I don't know what they're doing now. Um, the media doesn't speak very highly of them. Find, etc. But the evolution recognized that the from the Sarbanes Oxley Act and the need to so much was heavily weighted within the accounting profession. Um, you had some layers of convergence on information security, insurance, um, advisory. Uh, there was just so many elements enshrined within the accounting profession. And it, it actually impaired the focus of financial reporting. And so now you see so much degree of reliance on the different stock reports, the expansion of the various standards from ISO, COSO, IFRS. And so there was a need to really carve out the discipline and so certainly many years ago, this it became a focal point. And even now, when we truly need to drill down on to critical thinking, which is why we are all here. And so much of my focus these days have been on really transitioning into our operating landscape and of course, largely with one institution, but previously on a micro and macro level, um, prudentially. And to really be a part of the, the shift and dynamics to support our local financial institutions, right? Because Conwell Bank is one of those locally incorporated, owned and operating here in the Bahamas. And there is no parent company internationally to leverage capital support, decision making, decentralization of systems, um, the whole million dollar, billion dollar um, backdrop of support like some of the other Canadian banks would have. And that's where you need your, your specialized attention uh, to be deep rooted because this is my home in the 242. I know we have some gits and nevis here. And so it's important when you think about your Bahamian sovereignty and certainly your country's sovereignty across the waters in St. Gits and Nevis, um, and wherever our families may be um, globally, you want to be a part of the, the cutting edge tools and support for their enrichment, continuity and really just buoyancy, right? So buoyancy has been the, the key word from all of these primate risk factors that we have been really facing. So of course, the United Nations has been talking largely about climate change and what we're doing. So we've seen the, the, the evolution of our vehicles, the evolution of the whole customer segmentation and our service delivery platforms. So there's a, there's a criticality of basis for discipline. There's a criticality in how it leverages and converges with other specializations. So within my department, uh, which is still of course in its reorganization, I have coverage of compliance risk management, information security, um, IT compliance, there's fraud risk management, there's credit inspections, elements of credit risk. And there was one or two others that I have, oh yes, policy creation, legal, and a few others that is just explicit funding, right? Insurance is also there, apart from business continuity. So this is what ERM 
is all about. It's been a buzzword. And so really it's, it's this holistic coverage. And as a certified international risk manager, you have the, the ability to build on these fundamentals of critical thinking that allow you to come alive when the time is right. Now, what do I mean by that? You get into the boardroom and or, or in your um, decision rooms and everyone is silent because you're either listening to the biggest voice in the room, uh, the person who probably thinks they're the smartest, the person who has the biggest title, and we're all just there listening and sometimes we know the answer but we won't share if you have the crm designation you will not hold back you will not it's going to come out in your writing it's going to come out in your posture it's going to come out in the way you communicate about everything now, before we get into too much of force um, just yet, tonight is going to be largely about touching the surface. We're going to get our feet wet. I know we have three segments. Um, I cover modules three and modules four, so not to worry. We're going to have adequate coverage for the purposes of the exam, uh, as well as building you as intended practitioners of the future. So a little housekeeping matters. What time do you typically end your sessions before we get, because I could get excited and believe me, sometimes I don't look at the clock. We haven't had evening classes, but in the mornings it's normally standard two hours. Okay. So standard two hours, I believe the schedule indicated that this was three, uh, this particular module was three hours. Am I correct? I don't have it in front of me. I think Miguel neglected to send it to me. Yes, it's three hours. Three hours? Okay. Right. Oh, sorry. Okay. I was living in the future. Sorry. No, no, no. Modules, no, you're absolutely right. Modules one and two is typically two hours, right? Oh, okay. Um, now, a negotiable element, I believe, um, the intent of it was to be two and a half with a half an hour break, two 15 minute breaks. Now, I don't have a problem with us in terms of our time whether it be two hours or three hours. What I will say is we wanna cover the content, right? And if I have to truncate, um, but definitely the adjustment will be made along the way. The key though, is you have to do your reading because you're going to really be enriched with your reading and the level of discussion. Um, I don't typically go through every slide. I think that learning approach has gone out of the door um, from their kingdom come. We are all business professionals. Uh, and so what we want to do is we want to practice the discipline because the exam is, there are some, theory-based questions, but the practice is more important. I don't have any doubt that any of you will pass. The, the real question for me is, what will be your posture in applying the discipline when you go back to your normal course of business? That's the question. And so that's why it's important to understand your why. Right, so um, three hours is good, two hours is good. I would say on the remaining sessions, let's just manage the content coverage 
And if we need to cut off, we can certainly cut off. Let me look at the time now. I see it's 7.04. So eight o'clock is good for me tonight. We could have one hour coverage. And if we'd like to go over, I, I would not want to go over um, any more than 15 minutes to half an hour on the subject matter. But I would encourage you to read as much as possible. Yeah, that's fine. Sounds good. That's fine. Okay, so you guys, okay, I see thumbs up, Danica, Teresa. Um, okay, I get a thumb. Fine with me. Okay. Nagisha, that's good for you? Yes, that's fine. Okay, great. Now, I'll to do a little bit of review of module one and two. Is that okay? I think we've all come from the holidays and we're back now. And so much of this perhaps needs to be a little refreshed. So we could take about half an hour to do just a little quick refresh. Huh? Module one. So let's talk about it. What did we cover in module one? Because before we can understand module three, we need to fully appreciate how it transitions to module three from module one. Okay. Now, I don't have those slides in front of me. So let's talk about it, right? So what are the core concepts associated with the with Basel when we look at the three pillars, right? Because we talk about what is fundamental to risk management. So can someone break down the three pillars for me? Okay, great. As I enjoy my grade, I'm going to randomly select because guys, we're going to have a great time. It's important, right? So reading is important. So Shirella, is, am, I, am I pronouncing that correct? Yes. Mm. Shirella, I love your energy. <laughs> we're going to do well. Trust me, we're going to do well. So the three pillars, What's the first pillar of the oh. Basel Four principle? Oh boy, it's embarrassing, but um, I'm gonna try. Um, Do you want to leverage a quality? I'll phone a friend. Um, I, 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 sorry. Sounds good to me. Just risk transfer to one of your colleagues, and they will answer. Okay, because I was gonna say supervisory and and yeah um can yeah can I can I phone a friend anybody wanna wanna kick it off? Sure. <laughs> no no no. The way we're gonna do this is you pass it on to a specific person. Oh, I'm gonna pass okay. it on to Ebony. Ebony, okay. <laughs> okay, Great. so so Shirella, you were right with supervisory. Mm -hmm. And then you have capital adequacy and then market. Is that correct, Ms. William? Well, you're, you're on the right track. You're moving in the right direction because so we have an appreciation for segments of the pillars. But I want us to break down pillar one, right? Right. And I believe that Lenica put in the chat that it was capital, right? Right, so, she did. So, so that, is, that is correct, right? So the focus of, of Basel one, pillar one is capital. And of course, coming from uh, much of our background, why is, why, is, why is capital so important when you think about 
uh, business segments and operations? Why, why, is, why are capital requirements so important? In the event the business, <clears throat> in the event the business fails or um, you know something drastically happens to the market, you want to make sure that there's sufficient um, funds to um, you know basically cover investments and clients' funds, etc. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Can you understand me? I. I can hear you. I don't necessarily agree that I understand you, but we'll get there. Okay. Um, but definitely, I, I support that position. That's a, that's a resiliency position. But what is capital on the onset, right? Let's move away. Let's move away from the hearts of our respective offices that we, in our, in our office, right? We, we have these very tiny as business professionals and we have our idea we're capitalists but let's bring it to ground zero capital is really the money you start off with as a part of your working operations you need to carve out a certain amount for your working capital right and then you have a reserve amount that supports that position right and that's your contingency capital. So capital adequacy enshrines all of the risk sensitivity and complexity, value at risk factors that goes into normal course operation. And uh, the incumbency should contingent events arise, right? So that's where we are, right? So it's, a, it's important when you think about capital, and, and we're going we're gonna to sit here for another five minutes. When we think about capital in St. Kitts and Nevis, in Keisha, right? And you are assessing the various institutions, right? And you see certain fluctuations. Yes, I, I understand that there's a cars ratio. I, I can appreciate that. But what does the capital number tell you in itself? Even from a qualitative standpoint, what does the number stand out to me and you when you conduct your analysis at the institutional level? Keisha? Okay. Let's go to Chanel. I mean, can you say the question again? Sorry, I apologize. That's no problem. When you think about capital and mm -hmm. you factor the qualitative and quantitative metrics that I mentioned earlier, risk sensitivity, value at risk, incumbency, all of the, the wonderful things that we would have learned from Basel 1, 2, and 3, what is it? What does it tell you as an institution when you look at the capital numbers? What does it tell you? Mm, okay. Yikes. Um, when it comes to capital, I would say we should have a, um, an institution should be prepared definitely from the start. Mm -hmm. to absorb whatever the company is looking for to extending to. So looking in comparison to um, Basel 1 and 2, where Basel 1 is like a, everybody underneath the same thing, you know, nothing really too big, nothing, no extreme measures compared to Basel 2, where it's like you make sure you look at every single detail to make sure that, you don't miss anything. I haven't really gotten too deep into Basel III, but when it comes to the capital and making sure that we can, um, what are, uh, uh, here's the words for me. 
um, so make sure we can absorb out. the risk mm -hmm. properly. Yep. Um, I think it speaks to to that. That's what I've learned from looking at those things. Looking and at the and, and what are those risks, right? What are, what are those? What are three core components of the risk, right? Within mm -hmm. the pillar one, you have the credit risk, the market risk, and the operational risk. Right, reputational, right. Um, market. You said market, yeah, market risk. Um, I can't remember everything. Don't worry, remember. this is don't worry. This is a review. So okay, just getting the blood and oxygen flowing after our wonderful holiday weekend break. <laughs> right. So, right. Don't worry. So Teresa is going to now take this baton because it'll be important for us to understand the sub factors with, because we're just talking about capital, right? We haven't gone mm -hmm. into the other two villages yet. So right. Teresa, Chanel needs some help. Please. <laughs> um, what I kind of sort of understand from pillar one, like you've mentioned is, it's, I would say, is ensuring, one, that you have adequate capital for your operations, yeah. that, that you have reserve capital, that you're able to somehow sustain, um, like, shocks mm -hmm. relative to your credit risk and risks within the market, as well as anything that is unique to your business that will cause operational um, issues without one, totally collapsing your business and or two, having a negative impact on the, the wider industry, should you, let's say, fail or go under or need to have central bank bailout. I like where you're going, Teresa. Now, let's take this a little further. Let's bring it home. You're in compliance, correct? Is that yes. correct? Yes, okay. I am. So tell me, as a part of your onboarding, maintenance, and departure of customers, how does capital play a role in that? Well, for our um particular business um as it relates to capital we sell um mutual funds that's like one of our popular um i might be oh. wrong but let me just say oh, well i like i like where you're going Go ahead. We, we sell mutual funds and um it's one of our popular um products what we sort of have to manage with our mutual funds is one, the, the risk of redemption or having some sort of deposit run, even though we're not a commercial bank. And of two, course. and two um, is having excess liquidity to the point where we can't invest the funds. And we, it doesn't really affect our market risk because we don't lend. We don't do uncollateralized lending. Our lending has to do with you having the securities. And so um, sort of you, struggling, but that's- So as that's a part the, of your, so, so let's leverage the conversation here, right? Okay. So as a part of your compliance risk management, and strategic mm -hmm. business operation. Mm -hmm. Capital plays a part, firstly, when we think about strategic operations, we think about the onboarding and maintenance of customers throughout their investment life cycle mm -hmm. within the context of the mutual fund. Okay. So we, so we want to have a value at risk based on the risk segmentation or risk categorization of the customers according to their appetite, right? Okay. So you have your conservative, you have your hybrid, you have your risk acceptance, 
And so your capital buffers or your capital resiliency measures should be a percentage basis of or risk of failure or risk of redemption, as you mentioned. Should a customer redeems before maturity within the various portfolios? Oh. So what you would be doing is that you have an offset risk transfer by having your various clauses and um, indemnifications, whereby the risk reward dynamics discourages the behavior of early redemption. Okay. So, and that would be informed, for example, like the fees, making it so. Um, ah, exactly. So now, when you take the capital of the balance sheet, you now could go into your, your, what is it? Your expense, your income statement, and you'll be able to now look at the correlation between your the number of relationships you have, comparable to your opex, your your fee income and your capital, right? Because there should be a reasonable distribution in the, in the relationship curve between the redemption and the maintenance of those within the investment life cycle. Are we there? Did we get disconnected? No, I'm still here. Right? So when you report into the board, you're not just reporting, oh, we have X, Y, Z customers, um, we have this amount maintained or this amount that left uh, or this amount that we had to um, subscribe into the various portfolios. What you can actually say is this customer segmentation or this portfolio comprises a risk grouping of customers and this drives a certain dollar value of capital when we look at how that carves into our income generation, you can actually look at both the value chain of your relationship per category, per portfolio, as well as value at risk, meaning customers who they're, they're always antsy about almost micromanaging the operation. They want, yeah. they, they want their statements um, before time, if they don't get it, you know those customers, oh, I didn't get my statement. Really? There's online banking, right? Go and get it, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, um, or or they, they, all of a sudden, they are financial professionals who understand the value of their redemption and when securities values chain because they are a Bloomberg expert. Um, they have the KIPP number. They have they have all of these ISIN numbers and, and they... They have relationships with the brokers so they can tell you what's happening within their, within the context of their portfolio when there may have been a specially negotiated interest rate per grouping of the mutual fund, right? And I imagine your underlying investment is probably uh, fixed income securities with the government. Not all of it, but a, a, a great deal of it. We're trying right. to offload it because of the risk of default, but <laughs> yeah, you know but... that is, that discussion, you know, it really scratches my head because yeah, uh, I'm, we're gonna get back to that. I don't want to. Okay. Go I don't okay. Wanna, but, you, but you see where I'm coming from, right? Yes, I do. So that's where the risk manager comes alive in compliance. You do not have to work in risk; just apply the discipline to your profession or the area in which you work. Anyone that's working in risk management, you will understand your numbers, you will understand your business, and you will be able to communicate. You don't have to be an expert, but you will understand some core concepts and it will just spew up in everything you do. So very helpful discussion, right? So Lanika, as we think about these portfolios, and we think about, because we're leveraging now Teresa's uh, experience with compliance, and I believe, Lanika, you said you're in central banking and licensing. So you are the gatekeeper. And before much of these 
portfolios or mutual funds would have been established, not granted. We know Teresa is managed or supervised by Securities Commission and the, the SIA framework. So we understand that, right? And IFA frameworks, right? However, as a part of the supervisory context, there's some things that, that should be considered. What are, what are some of those core things? When we, we're still on Bill of One. We ain't move yet. What are some of those core things that we need to think about? Right? Taking, taking what we were just talking about in context. Make up. Yes, I'm here. Okay, great. So okay, what do so you say? Taking mm -hmm. into consideration what we just discussed specifically yeah. regarding capital. Yeah, and the pair, the, 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 and the subcomponents relative to capital. Uh -huh. And you and your role in the, what section that is again? Authorizations, right? Authorization, yes. Right, right, right. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Talk to me. What, talk to me. Tell me what does this mean? After you set them up, you've given me the license. Because here's where I'm going. Uh -huh. Where I'm going is Teresa's operation is not necessarily supervised by any institution that you would license. However, they have portfolios with Teresa. Right. And, and you license their operation. Is there something that could happen that you may need to advise the supervisory team? after setting them up? Well, um, unfortunately, after sending them out, um, it's really, um, we really rely on the supervisory team to, to no, no, um, no, keep up with us. I mean, not so what I, what I initially wanted to say is that, you know, um, yeah, in doing the initial assessment, we would, we, we have minimum capital requirements based on um, the activities the SFIs want to undertake, right? Um, and so once the business plan is in line with those proposed activities, um, there isn't much else that we do after that point. Now, um, once they start to engage with other SFIs and start to offer more products, then um, I think that that goes to the attention of the supervisory team who then would, um, you know, say, well, hey, we need you guys to increase your capital um, or, you know, whether they would be monitored closely, etc. So I think um, I need to phone a friend and ask Ebony what would what would then happen? Mm -hmm. Hi, Lenika. Um, could you repeat your question, please? Sorry. So if I'm understanding correctly, Mr. Williams was asking, um, what would Central Bank um, do from a supervisory perspective, if the if if a company like RF, um, sorry, Teresa, what's the name of the employer? You have it. That's it. RF. Okay. Mm -hmm. RF um, engages in. Um, other business and, and investments with our licensees. Okay. Um, Mr. Williams, yeah. you correct me if I'm wrong. I may have I just, I just love the question. Don't, don't even worry. I just love the absolute confusion which happened. Not to worry. Like it happens every day, right? So let's 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 bring it home. 
So I like the direction you were headed in. You set up the institution, you give them a certain delegated authority within the, uh, within the parameters. They move outside of these parameters and that's when you go right back to your, let's say your, the context of, of your um, camels, right? So your, so your capital and your assets and management, et cetera. So where I was going and you, you were moving along in that trend was the operational risk side, right? Because people process these systems is what is core when you think about capital. So many businesses don't understand. What we learned from COVID was that operations or many institutions did not carve out an operational risk value factor. So, what, so and a, a pure example of this is what happened in the hotel industry? What happened with so many sectors? They had to um, let staff go. Um, they, they couldn't factor in certain operational um, continuity of relationships, outsourcing relationships were, were impaired because when you are hiring an employee, you have to factor continuity of that employee. It may be a very minuscule number, but if you're talking about the impact that an employee has, then there's the going concern, the gone concern, and then ultimately the business disruption, which we all like to talk about. Don't worry, everybody loves to talk about the, the, the failure, but it's important to talk about the maintenance. And why I say that, year over year, just like how we capitalize pensions, you should capitalize the cost of your employees, right? Now, it sounds good. Some institutions are beginning to practice that. And what we are beginning to find is this, because they know about the incremental cost, you're seeing the evolution of technology, fintech, the need for autonomous services, um, more machine learning, anything where there is minimal human intervention because of the OPEX consideration, right? So that's something to think about. Most business plans factor what, a five year, up to five years when we think about licensing, right? And of course, everyone wants to license their business operation at the lowest level of risk. But you talked about the supervisory team, which really provides the guardrails when business continues, right? My point though, was even in at your level and in your department, we should be reading Bloomberg, the newspaper, Economist, um, New York Times, um, Financial Times, and any type of, like there's so much information out there at our disposal. It is, it is, it is unbelievable. And that information will help us to make more informed decisions because when various executives, board members, they begin talking about their operations, um, you will know and appreciate their posture for their own business, their respect or conformity with the parameters that you set within licensing. You'll also begin to understand their strategic objectives, their customer product service diversity, or perhaps maybe straight line consideration. And then you will even understand what is emerging because if you license a homogeneous type of business, uh, 
within a, let's say if it's, it's more on the, on the competitive side, let's say it's one of the core competition, then you will know that the next institution won't have the same requirements. And then you have to have this ongoing dynamic review of your own requirements so that ex new business will be aligned with the, biz with the changes globally from a micro and macro perspective. And then businesses which were pre-approved, when they renew their license, it should be a requirement that they align with certain objectives, right? So that's one of the things that I've seen come out of the come out of Singapore, out of Canada. Um, so I would say stay tuned with that. Some of the developments coming out of the FSA and OFA, those are some really, really dynamic um, considerations, right? So well, let's segue this into Pillar Two. Pillar Two and Shirella, you gave us the answer for Pillar Two, which was supervisory review. But well, what does this all mean? Because we I continue, I still am. Okay. So, um, are you saying that uh, capital should be in tandem with? the market volatility of the business? Absolutely. Uh -huh. If your, your capital should be proportionate to the risk posed by the institution in the normal course. So Basel will, Basel will give you a minimum, right? right. Mm -hmm. That minimum is 8% of risk rated assets. Now, when you, when you add on your counter cyclical buffers and all of your other factors, right? For resiliency, you have other dynamic risks because those are, that's minimum regulatory gap, right? And regulatory capital is insufficient to sustain operations in itself because you can have a, you can have a, a risk incident that can absorb a tremendous amount of your capital, right? And so it's important that while you cannot prepare for every single business incident, you want to be able on a best case scenario, uh, prepare within a level of reason. And that's done through stress testing or reverse stress testing. Most of the focus has been on stress testing. Now, because of COVID, there's an evolution on reverse stress testing. You'd see this within the information security discipline, where you have these, um, when you're testing your BCPs, you want to be able to test for zero day, uh, the, the absolute risk that you have access. There's a major disruption and what will it take for your systems to completely shut down where operations are impaired, right? Um, so, those, so those are things that you want to consider. Is capital adequate or sufficiently evidenced in the reporting or even in the discussions? Because you can have on balance sheet capital and off balance sheet capital, right? So your off-balance sheet capital may be the investment portfolios that act as a proxy capital to support certain segments of the business that principals of business want to invest and reinvest so that they can actually earn a return on their money as opposed to keeping it just laying flat in, reg in a regulatory space, right? So... Ebony is the host now. I don't know what that means. That's interesting. Okay. So, Danica, does that help you? It is. So, you are the host. All power to you, Ebony. It's a pleasure. No, I don't know how that happened. I, I wasn't even touching anything. Yeah. We may have. Let's we see may if have, I stopped. <laughs> we may have had a, a technical glitch on 